I'm Paul Erner, uh, GP in Orsonville, and uh, as you can see, uh, I'm a lot closer to this end of the spectrum than I was when I started practicing in Orsonville, so this is uh, relevant to me as well as relevant to you. So what I've listed down here, uh, what do we reckon are the top five cause of death in Australia? And then we'd break them up into males and females. Uh, so anybody like to have a bash at number one? I'll give you a clue. It's out of cerebrovascular disease, strokes, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, lung cancer, coronary artery disease, heart attacks and stuff, or chronic lung disease. What's the number one, do you reckon? Tom, what do you reckon? Heart, I think. Heart, good. Free cup of tea at the end of the show for you. Don, it's heart. Being you, Don, I'll put an arrow for Valentine's Day. Righto. Heart. What about number two? Number two. Roz? You're right. Cerebrovascular disease, strokes and stuff. <laughs> strokes, etc. Is that how you spell strokes? Yeah. Right, eh? That's right. Third. And third, and, and getting more and more. Well, we're living longer, and the thing we're not conquering quite as well is dementia and Alzheimer's, isn't it? And the more we conquer the other things, the more relevant that's going to become to our society. Uh, so we talk about preventative measures on that, and some of them are a load of, a load of bull, and some of them work. Number four. Number four. Don, you were starting to get onto it. Generally, or? A specific. Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Mrs. Backhouse gets a free cup of tea as well. That's very good. And the only other one, unless it's chronic obstructive airways disease. So, and, and we'll, we'll go through those, and we'll try not to get too boring, but if, if you break it up into males and females, heart disease, and I sometimes feel quite uptight when I look in articles and there's a big article on, say, cancer of the ovary, and we need to really focus on that. If we ignore heart disease, vascular, blood vessel disease of the, of the heart and the brain, they've got to be really high up on, on our priorities because in males and females, cerebrovascular disease has got to be high. And then, then they, I'm wrong, gee whiz, Alex, how do you strike that from the minutes? Um, Miles, it's Don, uh, no, Jan, that's right, lung cancer. Yeah, uh, even though, you know, as you know from the newspaper, young females are the ones being targeted by tobacco companies, uh, and they are the most resistant group, uh, still a lot more males than females smoke. Females, it's the, we were right the first time there. And then, of course, males, strokes, etc., brain disease. And females, we're still not cancer on the third one. It's, it's dementia, etc. Then number four, cancer, Don? Uh, cancer, I think it is. Yeah, what one? Uh, lung cancer. Uh, lung was there, and next one? Oh, well, then I was trying to the, the men's. Uh, yep, prostate, yep. Yeah, prostate. But, but um, when you see, you know, lots of things about prostate and whatnot, Still only 4% of males die of prostate cancer. So it's, it's sort of pretty well down. Um, then we get to lung with the females who haven't seen the light. But I mean, lung cancer is the one that we're winning on because it's the one public relations disease uh, we're winning on smoking. And of course, 95% of lung cancer is due to smoking. So you can, by not smoking, you eliminate 95% of lung cancer. Pretty clear cut. And then we get chronic obstructive airways disease, that one, and 
Yep, breast cancer. That's Shirley, was it? Good on you. But again, of females, breast cancer is only 4%. Because if we're looking at, um, at these percentages up here, and, and I'll, once we get this background, I'll stop being as boring. Um, these percentages up here, 16%. A deaths are caused by that in males, 14% in females. This, 10 years ago, was 21%. What's made the difference? The thing that was on catalyst, Lipitor, the statins. We say, hang on, hang on, hang on. What about bypass surgery and stenting and whatnot? If you look at the data on bypass surgery and stenting, it's left main disease, which is the main artery down the left side of the heart, is the one that increases your, your lifespan. Stenting and whatnot of the other arteries get rid of angina and things, but there's not much evidence they increase your lifespan. So it's left main disease that, that it does, but the big thing is, is the statins. Uh, the statins are, you know, Lipitor, Lipex, Crestor, those sort of things, Pravacol. They, for every 1%, you drop your LDL cholesterol, your crook cholesterol, uh, you drop your risk of a heart attack by 2%. So you drop it by 20%, you're dropping your risk by 40%. Uh, why the government won't let everybody have them is because if your risk is already low, you know, dropping 20% of low is still pretty low. So you, you don't get as much bangs for your buck. If your risk is high, then of course you drop it by 20%, it's a really significant change. But then as we slip off to the side, yeah, what about the side effects of that? What happens with cholesterol is we get it from two places. What we eat and what our liver makes. What we eat is up to us. What our liver makes depends on what parents we picked. Family history especially. So you can, you know, do the, uh, what was it, the Pritikin diet, wasn't it? But his diet was so terrible he ended up committing suicide, the bloke who invented that. So that's not a good advertisement for it. Um, so uh, if you drop your cholesterol in your diet and you're still making a lot in your liver, then you'll still have a high cholesterol. So that's where the statins come in. They switch off that. Getting onto side effects, 8% of people, it irritates their liver and the statins are no good for them. But what you do is you just do a blood test before and after. If the liver function test change, statins are not good for them. 92% it's great. But 12% of people get muscle pain and it's really hard. I took them once and I thought, yeah, I should take these. And I had all these aches and I stopped it. And my aches still stayed there. And mainly it was because I was training for Kokoda and walking up lots of hills. Uh, but, and it made no difference to me. So uh, the muscle ache is a trial and error thing. 8% uh, of people, liver. They talked about in that Catalyst program about loss of memory. That's a temporary thing and, and it's very rare. So, that program did a t heck of a lot of damage because our 21% down to 16% in 10 years is, is magnificent. You know, one of the best uh, medical changes we, we've had for a long time. Uh, then, if we're looking at lung cancer, 6.6% of men. Strokes were 9.7% of female and 6% of male. Uh, dementia here in females was 8.7%. Don't forget, females live longer than males, and so they live longer to get things. Uh, 84, 84 years old is the average in female, and 80 years for the average in males. Um, prostate in males, remember, was about 4%. Breast was about 4% in females. Lungs. So lung cancer is more common in female than breast cancer, as a cause of death than, than breast cancer is. Of course, you die much better. The survival rate of lung cancer is only about 20%, whereas breast cancer, 11% uh, of ladies get it, but 4% die of it. Um, chronic obstructive airways disease, about 4%. Then, while we're, while we're raving on, I'll just mention some of the others. If you go males, then move on to dementia next, then colorectal cancer, and it's worth putting that down, actually. That means bowel cancer, okay? Six, 
is dementia. Seven is bowel cancer. I mention that because we're making great inroads into that. Uh, females, lots of the chronic obstructive airways disease, it basically comes from two causes in the large, smoking and, uh, and asthma. Then if we go to eight, diabetes, that's very trendy to talk about because diabetes is there, but it impacts on everything else. If you've got diabetes and you've also got a high cholesterol, also got high blood pressure, or also smoke, or also got a bad history, bad family history, it, it compounds itself. So diabetes is a multi-system disease that has to be hit in a number of ways. Uh, and seven is diabetes for females. And uh, where's eight? Eight. Oh, Eight is heart failure. Uh, that's where it doesn't pump as effectively, but there's a big crossover between that and the first one. And a lot depends on how lazy the doctor is on writing his, his death certificate about how some of these things end up. Death certificates are funny things because, you know, you do your best estimate. If someone um, has got heart disease, um, then uh, and, and they die in non-suspicious circumstances, then you're inclined to um, say heart disease was the cause. So it's not a totally exact science, but it's a pretty exact science. So if we look at those, what can we do about them? Let's go down just quickly about uh, heart disease, for instance. We control the risk factors for heart disease. The risk factors for heart disease, no, are smoking, top risk factor, higher than lipids, higher than your cholesterol. So if you smoke and come along and say, oh, Paul, I want you to check my cholesterol, I say, hang on, you're ignoring the main risk factor, that you damn well still keep smoking. So, Smoking, so what can you do about smoking? We won the public relations thing on that one. All smokers know it's crook. All smokers would secretly like to stop smoking. Some of the new things can help them. You know, the patches that first came out uh, doubles your risk of giving up if someone wants to. The tablets you take that stop the, your craving in your brain triples your risk of giving up, but you've got to want to give up. Don can't come in and say, I smoke and I love it, Paul, and it's great, it's my big friend, it's my lover, uh, it helps me relax and I feel good when I smoke, uh, but I'd like to stop, uh, but, uh, but it's still a good friend. You're not going to win on that bloke. Don's a lost cause until he decides, I want to stop smoking because it's no longer my lover, my friend, it's my enemy. Uh, it's, it's trying to uh, muck up my health and ruin me while masquerading as my friend. So as soon as Don makes that psychological change, gee, this is damaging me, I need to do something about it, then you can grab him, double his chances with the, uh, with the patches, and triple his chances with the Zyban or Champix. Uh, the tablets, yeah, because what they do is they saturate the nicotine receptors in your brain that are the feel-good thing when you get nicotine, um, and, and you don't get a buzz out of nicotine, so it blocks that buzz. And so if you do smoke, it doesn't give you a customary buzz anyway, and so it's not worth it. You feel guilty because you smoke, it doesn't give you the buzz, it's a lose-lose. And, and you keep that going for 12 weeks. Psychologists tell us it takes about eight weeks to change any habit, but smoking's got a chemical habit as well on our brain. So about 12 weeks, uh, you block it off. So the government will let you get them for a fortnight, uh, and if the patient is still smoking, they won't let you prescribe any more because they're not going to spend 200 bucks on a fella who hasn't stopped. Because if he hasn't stopped in that first fortnight, he's not going to. So smoking, you can do a lot more about. But the big thing is the public relations because it's no longer with it. I mean, you remember when we were all kids, the really with it people smoked and the with it film star smoked. They don't now. No, it's, it's no longer cool. So smoking, uh, lipids, Diet, 
Yep. Yeah, Don, that's a really interesting thing because these electric cigarettes, cigarettes, there are two types of things. There's a nicotine inhaler that gives people a bit of a nicotine hit but without the carcinogens that are the lung cancer stimulating things. And you sometimes use that uh, on people uh, who've just got to do something with their hands, you know. Uh, they're blocking the craving. Uh, and you sometimes use that early on as an adjunct but it depends on, uh, on what you do. Uh, the electric gadgets, when they came out, we thought, that's great, because it's got nothing to do with nicotine, but it handles it. But a recent trial showed that there was no difference in the people who used those and people who didn't about the stopping smoking rate. So that was a bit uh, disenchanting. They come with all sorts of different sort of flavoury things in the smoke. But the, the most recent trial, which was about a month ago, uh, put the kibosh on them a bit. But that was the idea. That was the idea. Yes, I just had a, a thought about smoking, but... Uh, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> uh, well, dementia's further down. <laughs> uh, so when you, when you look at these things, because of smoking uh, and vascular disease, um, uh, if we don't smoke, we've got 66% less chance of getting vascular disease, which hits that one, that one, and lung cancer, we already talked about, it's 95%. Um, and, and dementia, we'll, we'll talk about dementia, and it's, it's associated with vascular disease as well. So smoking is, is dreadful. Then we move on to lung cancer. We already talked about that. Smoking, 95% of that um, is smoking related. Uh, passive smoking is, is a problem, perhaps not quite as much of a problem as some people say. There are some studies done on smoking when people used to smoke in submarines and so the blokes had passive smoking lots and lots and, and it didn't make a heck of a lot of difference it just makes some difference it aggravates asthma and chronic bronchitis and stuff in kids but the cancer rate is not as much as we might have thought although it is up um, the big thing and so smoking picking the right parents um, controlling your lipids your crook cholesterol are the big deals there and exercise if you exercise and we'll talk about exercise specifically because it's such a winner it, it bores the blazes out of GPs because we'd never go to a conference now without there being some exercise guru haranguing us about that we should be haranguing patients so we're harangued from both ends the patients who don't want to do it and the blokes are telling us that we should um, exercise if you exercise for and again we'll talk about it specifically your heart rate greater than 70% of its maximum for a minimum of 20 minutes for a minimum of three times a week, you, you double your survival after a heart attack. So I'll say that again. 70% of your maximal heart rate is roughly equal to a bit short of breath. So I couldn't be walking with Roz and exercising at 70% of my heart rate and windbag on like this. Uh, if I could say, nice morning, uh, dog looks sick, uh, that sort of thing, then 70% of my maximum, or sweating a bit. So the good thing about it is, even if you're pretty decrepit and your heart's a bit crook, 70% of its maximum can be achieved. So you haven't, if, you're, if you're crook and you've got a crook heart, you might go along like that and get to 70% of your maximum. So it still holds true for you. Y you with me? So... Yeah, Marilyn. Is that because no matter how, what your state of health is, or your age or whatever, you're actually just exercising the heart and all the heart functions 
options? Yeah, you'll notice I said you doubled your survival after a heart attack. And that's because when you exercise, your heart says, oh, hell, this is hard work. I need to sort of create or open up some of my smaller blood vessels so that uh, they're doing some of the work. So you've got more blood vessels opened up in your heart if you've been exercising. So if one of them blocks, there are more friendly ones around to take over some of that job. So what I do is my feet are clapped, so I swim. So I swim for 22 minutes because I'm, I'm in for maximum bangs for my buck. Um, so, yes, with minimum work, minimum time, um, I swim for 22 minutes because in two minutes I'll get my heart rate up to 70% of its maximum and then I'll swim for 20 and then I'll get out. Uh, so I'm, that's, that's not perfect, but it is maximum bangs for your buck. Uh, any exercise is better than none, but I, I divert. So we're moving down here. We're moving heart on male and female, yes. Uh, we're moving on to strokes. Re remember I set up here for heart prevention, smoking, family history, and lipids. For stroke prevention, you talk about smoking, family history, and blood pressure control. Blood pressure control is much more important in the stroke element of things than the heart element of things. So blood pressure control is very important. And when we get on to dementia, there was a great trial in Manchester, in Britain, that looked at uh, dementia prevention. And, you know, and everybody says, oh, you eat lecithin and you, uh, uh, you do a lot of Sudoku and you always do the cryptic crosswords and, uh, and you have intellectual conversations with your mates. It didn't make any difference. It made people happier and get on better and socialise better, but it didn't decrease the dementia rate. The big thing in the Manchester trial was blood pressure control. Uh, it, it really said we've got to control both the top and the bottom, the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, for dementia prevention. It's the same stuff as for, for stroke prevention, but it's even more important because, as we said before, we're living older long enough to get dementia, which is a hell of a thing to get. And all of us secretly dread that, and when we put the milk back into the, um, into the microwave instead of the fridge, we think, strike, is that the first sign? You know, I'll just shut this up, I'm sorry. I don't know how to. It says reject. Well, just ignore that noise, would you? <laughs> so, but the other thing with dementia that's very, very recent is exercise. Now, how the heck this does it, I, I don't know. But exercise in some of the most recent trials, their exercise, they were talking about 30 minutes, five times a week minimum, decreased dementia by 50%. Now that's amazing, and that's so new, we're not totally sure. You know, it, it might be the lesser than story that made no damn difference. Um, but it looks like blood pressure control and exercise are the really proven things of dementia. There are new tablets out called Reminal, uh, and that are meant to uh, stop the progression of demen uh, dementia, particularly, and slow the deterioration down. They came out with about great fanfare about five or six years ago. Um, some people they help, they're certainly not the bee's knees. Um, if you look at carer input on demented people two years after taking them, there was no difference. So you have a bash, uh, but you, you don't hold immense hope. Prevention is the only way we've got so far, which is blood pressure control and exercise. Um, then we get on to prostate, and, and that is a GP nightmare an absolute nightmare. The US Task Force of Preventative Medicine, which is the most authoritative world body on what things work, because you instinctively think some things work, they ought to, but there are side effects on the treatment and you mightn't have needed it and, and all sorts of things like that. And maybe you didn't have it even though the test was positive. So the two that are sort of topical are PSA and it's a no-brainer. US Task Force of Preventative Medicine said there is no evidence that by doing routine screening PSAs we make any difference to the longevity of people. The Australian College of Urologists, the blokes who treat that, say um, we, we should be doing it. Uh, the Australian Cancer Society says uh, you should talk to your doctor. Um, and, and it's one of the hard conversations because I say I don't get it done 
because there's not evidence. But then again, Don comes to see me. He says, Paul, I think, you know, um, my wife says I should get a PSA done. I say, Don, there's no evidence for that, mate. That it increases longevity. You might diagnose you earlier. Um, then two years later, Don gets cancer of the prostate. Then Jan says, if you weren't so pig-headed, Paul, I would still have my lovely Don with me now. So you can see why it's a no-brainer, you know? Um, so uh, a, a lot of experts say we're curing more people, cancer of the prostate. A lot are saying we're creating a lot of impotent, incontinent people um, and haven't made a difference to longevity. The, the, it's a no-win. A no I haven't got the answers. I only know what I do because I'm more interested in sex and not being, and being continent than I am scared of having that. Uh, so that's it. PSA test is a blood test which measures a chemical which is a prostatic specific antigen, a chemical secreted by the prostate in increased amounts in cancer tissue than in non-cancer tissue. So if, uh, if you have a cancer of the prostate, in more than 75% of those cases, the level will be elevated. It may be the future holds in we do a baseline PSA and someone who's rapidly accelerating. Our difficulty is uh, then our treatment is not necessarily as good as our diagnosis. So it's a, a dilemma. Why I mentioned, I mentioned ovary in the same speech because there's stuff on emails. My wife got one, you know. Uh, your doctor needs to do a CA125, a routine screening blood test for cancer of the ovary. United States Task Force for Preventative Medicine, the Australian Cancer Society, the College of GPs, all of those say we've got no evidence that screening a whole population of that increases the longevity of cancer of the ovary. I mean, you'd say, but hang on, if you just find it early, you're more likely to cure it. Yes, but if you look at massive population studies, there's no evidence that that makes, that makes a difference. Uh, as opposed to you're investigating someone with bloating, pelvic mass, whatever, then, then their CA125 will be up. But it, it's down the list. If you look at cancer of the ovary, where are we? In females. It's 1.3%. It's about number 16 in cause of death. So although it's dreadful, it's, uh, it's, it's low down. And again, all of these things you can't get yourself wound up about something down there if you're not addressing those things up there. That's the uh, sort of take-home message. Then we wander down here. Ah, oh, we get on to bowel cancer. Bowel cancer is, um, I think, in, in the combined group, let me see, combined group, it's about, uh, about sixth or seventh. Um, if you've got a family history of polyps, of the malignant type, and they're called tubular adenomas. Ken, don't you fall asleep, mate. Uh, you, you, you might, you've got to get your bowel test, okay? Um, then, uh, if you've got a family history, you've got double the normal chance. It's, it's next to lung cancer as a population cancer that's a worry. So the government have got this um, sort of fairly sporadic sort of screening test, in my opinion, all GPs should be screening people over 40 or at the very latest over 50 with the three, the three poo tests, you know, three little jars, do it, and that should be just part of a routine checkup. Routine checkup should incorporate all these things. Um, if you do that simple test every two years, I do it every one year um, because I forget which year I'm in, um, and uh, if we do that simple test, we cut down the risk of cancer of the bowel by 66%. Uh, yeah, 66%. You get rid of two thirds of bowel cancer when they're at the polyp stage and the, the gastroenterologist, while he's there, while he's looking up your tail with a black snake, he just grabs the polyp and, and, and burns it off. So it's a, it's a simple thing, dramatic results. Um, then we get on to diabetes. And as we said, impact, it impacts on a number of these other things, strokes, heart attacks. Um, and what do you do about diabetes? Well, you try not to be fat. Um, and people say, well, it's getting towards 20% of over 60-year-olds in Australia have got diabetes. Um, 
And as we said before, diabetes is a multifunction sort of disease, Fix, affects lots of different organs and you need to treat it in different ways. Because if you've got diabetes, you're much more prone to get the vascular, vascular disease, the heart attacks and, and, and strokes, etc. as well as you know, your vision things, your kidney things. Uh, but prevention-wise, uh, there was one conference I went, went to where this obsessive bloke um, Reckon that if you've got a patient, type 2 diabetes we're talking about here, this is the one you get when you're over 40 and most people are overweight. Um, and this bloke reckoned that if you've got patients skinny enough, uh, then they'd all lose their diabetes. That, that is blatantly not true because I've got a few skinny patients who've, st who've still got it. But you're much less likely to get it and it's much easier to control. Remember type 2 diabetes, ordinary type 1 diabetes that you get when you're 14 or, or 28, that you need insulin injections for, that's because your pancreas, the gland at the back, is not producing enough insulin to suck your sugar across from your bloodstream into your, into your um, cells to give them energy. Because insulin is the truck that transports glucose from in the bloodstream across into each cell. In type 1 diabetes, the young one, there's not enough insulin. So that's why you have insulin injections to replace it. But it's pretty hard to juggle a dose as, uh, as good as God made your pancreas to do it sort of thing. Uh, type 2 diabetes, you've got the right amount of insulin, but there's a resistance built up. So your truck sort of loads up the glucose, tries to drive across the cell wall and meets roadblocks and Russian troops at the Ukrainian border, all that sort of stuff, and it has trouble getting across. The two ways of decreasing insulin resistance, three ways really, one is if you have less fat on board, there's less insulin resistance. Second, if your uh, appropriate dieting, uh, then you have less insulin. But the big thing, big thing, if you do 10,000 steps a day, and roughly we all do about 3,000 steps a day on the average, and we'd need to do about 45 minutes of walking to add another seven. Uh, if you do 10,000 steps a day, you halve your insulin resistance for the next 24 hours. So the patients you love to treat with type 2 diabetes are the ones who take it seriously and lose weight and the ones who exercise. I'll talk about exercise separately. So that, that's sort of an overview um, of why you die and sort of what you can do I'll just mention, Don mentioned cancer early on. Um, I'll just put up cancer as a separate issue. Cancer, overall cancer is responsible for 29% of deaths. Lung cancer is responsible for about 6% of those. These don't add up to 29, so don't bag me on that. Um, and we talked about lung cancer. Bowel cancer is the next one, and we talked about that. Bowel screening is essential. If you wait till you lose weight, you're constipated, you're pooing blood, uh, then you've waited too long. You might still get it cured, but you're well down the track compared with a polyp stage. It takes about eight years to develop from when a polyp's first there to when it becomes a malignant polyp. So that's why these five yearly follow-ups, uh, you know, okay. Lymphoma and leukemias, they are getting much... Lymphoma is now 80% curable, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, uh, and leukemia as well. I remember when I was a resident at a hospital, a, a kid came in with leukemia, uh, acute lymphatic leukemia, the common one in childhood. You know, they were dead. You knew they were going to die. Uh, and then while I was there, uh, people started to use chemotherapy. And I was at Royal Brisbane, and my opinion then was they're just torturing these kids. But out of that has come that now 85% of that's curable, which is just wonderful, you know. So, I, 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 yeah. Prostate, we've talked about, and I always try and avoid talking about it. Um, breast, what can we do about breast cancer? Um, mammography has made a difference. Uh, it's made a good difference. It cuts your death rate down by 30% because you find it earlier when it's more curable. You'd sort of think, wouldn't you, that it would cut down by a lot more than that. But that's the data. It decreases your risk by about 
The other thing that's made a great difference for breast cancer um, treatment is that, not that the surgeons are any better, but they do a belt and braces job on um, when they think it hasn't seeded off, still have chemotherapy, which hits tiny cells that have seeded off um, and stops them coming back. So more chemotherapy early has made a lot of difference to the survival from breast cancer and mammography has as well. Skin is 1.4%. Uh, a bit like, let's say, a bowel screen should be a normal part of a general checkup. Skin being checked should be a normal part of a general checkup, otherwise, you're missing things that are there, you know. And all we know, melanomas are the, uh, are the worst ones. 15% of those seed off, so the ones on your arms and legs you not, uh, often get away with for longer, but on head and neck, need to be treated early and aggressively. Dementia, we said those early figures, 50%, which sort of, 50% is sort of too good to be true, so, so, but there's going to be something in it. We're just not quite sure how that is. Diabetes though, diabetes, that business I was talking about before, 10,000 steps a day, um, and there are different exercises do different things. Um, so that exercise drops the risk by 58%, and that's true. Um, you know, it's not like the dementia one that's still open for debate. And it decreases the overall deaths. You can drop your death rate by 23% by exercise. The exercise that this data is based on is, is 30 minutes a day, five days a week minimum. 150 minutes a week, okay? My, uh, I'm so slack that I stick to the original data on the 20 minutes a day, 70% maximum heart rate, um, uh, five days a week. So I stick to that. But the psychology of exercise is amazing, isn't it? Um, I know, it's, it's my job, I know how important it is, I harangue people about it, I talk to them about it, uh, I, I love it, I read articles about it, I go to conferences about it, but it's such a pain, isn't it? Uh, it can be. Now, Marilyn, of course, is the local senior guru in the Orsonville Walling Bar Fun Run Challenge and is uh, maybe pipped this year by Christine at the surgery, who's been training hard, Marilyn, I'll warn you on that. Uh, but I'm a marshal, and uh, if you, you can cut corners, providing there's a little bit of backhanded business, okay? So, where was I before I got on to Marilyn there? Oh, yeah, exercise. Um, so, Less than 10 minutes at a time. No, the exercise people say any is better than nothing. But if you look at the data, less than 10 minutes a time really does damn all. It doesn't make any difference to your blood pressure, etc. 10 to 20 minutes makes a bit of difference. Uh, so really, uh, you need 30 minutes, unless you're like me and you swim like blazes for the first two laps so that your heart rate goes up quickly. Then that, that's more bangs for your buck. That's an insider tip. Um, so 30 minutes, um, three times a week, is, uh, is really goes up the curve for good things you can do. After that, the more you do, the better, but the curve flattens out. You don't get quite as many bangs for your buck. You with me? You with me, Tom? No, you're not? To get the most benefit for the least effort, it's 30 minutes three times a week. To, f to get these benefits here, all of them to their full extent, you need 30 minutes five times a week. But you haven't got to run, you know. Don, you haven't got to run. You, you can't do it with your foot up, but you haven't got to run, okay? Um, you've just got to walk or exercise hard enough to a little bit of sweat or you can't yarn to the person you're with. But I touched on the psychology of it. It's really hard when you're busy or you're bored or you're lonely or you're anything to get up in the morning or, um, or any time and exercise unless you've got a love of the outdoors and exercise. Most of us have got a theoretical love of that, but, uh, but don't. Uh, I think the main key is doing it with a mate, someone else. Shirley grabs Ken and says, Ken, what Paul said really resonated with me. We have got to do, I'm not going to take that five days a week stunt. I'm going to, do, we've got to do 30 minutes, three times a week. If you do it with a mate, you've got a commitment to them, you'll do it. 
I used to think walking with your dog might go, but the dog doesn't punish you and you don't feel bad when you say, oh, no way, Friday day today, I'm too tired. But you say to your mate, you've got to ring him up and say, look, I'm not walking today because I'm too slack. You don't feel like doing that. You feel slack doing that. You feel more slack doing that than walking, so you walk. In fact, I, uh, I swim each morning with a bloke called Barry from Hapa, Barry Campy, from Hapa 6 to 7. And I said to Barry one day, Barry, I think I could be gay. He said, what? <laughs> I said, well, every morning I leave a lady I'm very attracted to who's warm and cuddly beside me and I get up and I swing with an ugly coot like you. So anyway, Barry looked a bit relieved at the explanation. Anyway, so where did I go with that? Oh, yes, uh, how psychologically, uh, you know, you, 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 you've got it. And I think walking with a mate is the only thing. When I was training for Kokoda to walk with my son last year, um, I had a, a long way <laughs> to bring my fitness up to that. And my son-in-law got me one of those MP3 players, you know, where you listen to really exciting books. And I had a whole series of books with Bob Swaggart, who was a sniper. And uh, they, for the first time, I realised why people walk around looking like nerds and freaks with those MP3 players when they exercise. Uh, because when my book had run out, I decided I'd done enough exercise for that day instead of keeping going. So I think MP3 players, if your technology uh, is up to that, uh, is great. But you, if you walk with a mate, you're committed to them, you will do it. And also, it's a friendly thing to do. Just on exercise, it decreases falls and therefore hip fractures by 41% by someone who exercises 30 minutes, five days a week. Yes. It is. Balance exercise, like the stepping up program and whatnot that's run in the uh, Anglican uh, hall there with Sherry Ann, um, uh, makes that even better, the falls. But if you want to do something by yourself that's got lots of bangs for your buck all around stopping you dying early, uh, then the exercise and the falls program uh, are, are extra. Along as, say, osteoporosis, you know, with hip fractures, you're more likely to fracture your hip if you've got osteoporosis. So what's the, what I do, swimming, is no good for osteoporosis. That form of exercise. Exercise has got to be weight-bearing to help osteoporosis. Um, anxiety. Anxiety is amazing. If you, for anxiety, it needs to be special exercise. It's got to be in the morning, because that's when you kick off your endorphins for the day and you soak up the extra adrenaline that the anxiety people have got. And you do that by 30 minutes in the morning and pushing yourself. Uh, and it's a... No, I'll get off the track, I won't mention that. Right. Anxiety is really soaked up by strenuous exercise. That exercise needs to be pushing yourself so you know you're being pushed. Depression is, is the normal old exercise, 70% of your maximum, bit short of breath, bit sweaty, decreases, 30% doing that. If you push yourself, depression goes down by 47%. So you say, how much? If you're lazy like me, you do the 30 minutes three days a week. If you take notice of, uh, of people who know about this sort of stuff, you do 30 minutes five days a week. And the type of exercise is heart, blood vessel exercise, it's anything that gets your heart rate up, whether it be swimming, skipping, cross trainer, walking sort of thing. If it's diabetes, it's the number of steps you take and diabetes can spread their exercise out. It's what they do in the 24 hours that counts. Um, yep, so the summary with this is, wait for it. <laughs> We've got to agree with the conferences you go to that exercise, as you can see, uh, makes a lot of difference. So these are the things. They're the things that you guys do here. And they actually make more of the difference than we doctors do. Exercise, 30 minutes, three to five times a week. Smoking not on. Obesity and nutrition. 
just, just about 70% of males are obese and 55% uh, of females. But if you're obese and don't exercise, you're tremendously worse off than you're obese and you exercise, because exercise gets rid of a lot of the risk of obesity. Sure, if you lose the weight, you're better off, but if you exercise and stay overweight, um, you, you, you get rid of a lot of the, the problems you had. Uh, so those are the things. Family history, you should go backwards in time like these movies and pick different parents. So you're stuck with that. So those are the things that you guys can do. And you can do that at any age. Um, and very few of you smoke, so you've only got two things to do. Look at what you eat and exercise. Um, then we look at what doctors do. Blood pressure control, as we said, strokes and dementia and to a lesser extent heart disease. Lipids, if your cholesterol's high, 20%, 27% of those people have got some form of vascular disease. If your cholesterol's low, only 4% of those people. So you need to artificially get it down uh, with diet, statins. The bowel screen, as we said, to Marilyn, 66%. Mammography, as we said, 30%. Skin examination, Remember, skin's only 1.4% of, of deaths in Australia. Uh, and so as, as things go, it's not, not major, except that your skin's always is pretty easily available to have a squeeze at. Um, and, uh, and as part of a general checkup, that should be done. Cuts down by 90%, perhaps smear by 96%. That's the end of my rapid fire speech. You got questions, Diane? I've numbed you into submission. You've decided you're not going to exercise, but you're feeling guilty about it now. Well, that's a start. That's a start. Yes, Shirley. Well, when it comes to statins, do you have a preference? And if so, how do you arrive at that preference? Well, um, Crestor's the, the in one. Lipitor's out because it, um, it got stick because it was the first one, so any stick given to the statins, Lipitor was named. Um, I traditionally use Lipitor. You check people a, a month later. Crestor, you... Crestor is more powerful, and on really resistant people, you can push the dose up and get cholesterol down more. But most people on less powerful ones, you can get it down. Now, say you get someone who gets abnormal liver function tests on Lipitor or Crestor um, or muscle pain. If you get a Pravacol, which is a weaker one, uh, and use Pravacol, you can often achieve the cholesterol-lowering effect that you are looking for without the side effects. So it's horses for courses. I tend to, because uh, I'm old and grey, stay in the middle road that I'm used to and stick with Lipitor. And if I can't get the dose I'm looking for, I push to Crestor. And if I get side effects, I go down to Pravacol. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And, yeah. No, the liver ones, if you've got abnormal liver function tests more than twice normal, then that, then that will stay there, right? Uh, the muscle ones, that's, that's a hard one uh, because some people seem to be transient and some people it keeps going. So I get people, they say, Paul, look, I'm getting these aches. Stop them for three weeks. And they say, yeah, I'm better. You always get them to start them again three weeks later to see if they come back because muscle ace is a pretty transient thing. Uh, but it's about 12% of people have to stop them because of muscle pain. Does the bowel screening pick up if, if the, if the uh, existence of already polyps? polyps yeah, bleed? yeah. It, it picks up because uh, polyps bleed, not just malignant polyps. Uh, remember, polyps called tubular adenomas that sort of sit out in the bowel like that. 20% um, of those will, of a tubular adenoma type will go on to be a bowel cancer on the average over eight years, but they don't wait till they get there before they start leaking blood, and that's what you're detecting. And the modern bowel tests detect faecal human haemoglobin, so it's only human blood. We used to be a bit worried if you'd eaten chops the day before and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but of people who've got a positive faecal human haemoglobin, if the test comes back positive, only 5% of those have got a malignancy, a malignant polyp or, or whatever. Um, uh, most of those are either normal, and you don't know why they bled, or they've got a polyp which they nip off to stop it progressing. Did I answer your question? I got lost in my own speech. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. Uh, Tom, uh, I didn't mention that. Um, uh, nutrition and whatnot. 
Um, fruit and vegetables decrease uh, diabetes, taking, uh, they decrease obesity. Um, they decrease dementia, all, all to variable extent, not dramatic. The, the only thing is, um, fruit particularly has got a lot of sugars, so some people who are obese eat, love fruit and eat, eat lots and lots. If you're trying to get those people to lose some weight, you go down to two, two fruit a day. And the CSIRO diet, for instance, which is a pretty middle of the road, very effective diet because you don't feel hungry in it, um, it says two bits of fruit a day. But uh, the more vegetables you have, the more healthy from the point of view of vascular disease and obesity you are. Uh, can you have too much? Only the people who are, um, uh, who are overweight, trying to lose weight, uh, can be the sugars. Yeah, well, you should keep going because you're certainly no fatty arbuncle, are you? <laughs> so you're, you're doing the right, for you, you're doing the right thing because there are lots of good vitamins and, uh, um, you know, anti-carcinogens in it. There's a lot of work. Rosemary Stanton, you know, you often see her, the dietitian, talking where people have artificially take the tablets to get the vitamins. What she points out is there's a lot of stuff in fruit and vegetables that we don't really understand and know about that do the good and by being selective about getting the vitamins in a pill, we're not getting the full benefit of, of the fruit and vegetables. Um, when is um, kidney failure figures into those things or is it very Yeah, kidney failure is well down and it used to be when I was a lad, where's kidney failure come? Kidney failure... 1.75% of deaths, ninth in the overall cause of death of males and females. It used to be uh, Bex powders for acetone. So half the people on the renal transplant program used to be Bex, Bex powders, and the other half were roughly childhood vesicoteric reflux where your valves from your bladder let urine go back up to your kidneys instead of coming out. Um, they were the two causes. Phenacidin is now out, so the people who were going to get kidney failure from that are dead uh, because it, it was stopped so long ago. Uh, the cytouretic reflux, we're much better at diagnosing that now, so that's down. So most kidney failure now is due to a progression of vascular disease and sort of linked up with you know, the, the, the vascular disease, which is associated with heart disease, with strokes, and with kidney failure. So the prevention of kidney failure over a lifetime is controlling vascular disease, which are particularly blood pressure and lipids. Blood pressure as, as, a, as an individual risk factor uh, makes you much more inclined to kidney failure. And you know, people who are developing, you know, their kidneys failing off, you try and control their blood pressure really low. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yep. Oh, kidney stones. Yeah, they're a bit of fun. You, you can, <laughs> you know, you, people who've had kidney stones and have had babies um, uh, say kidney stones much worse. Uh, you can pick a kidney stone bloke. You, you meet him at the surgery and, and he's like that. He's like that. And he goes and leans against the wall and he keeps on changing position. You can pick it. Um, so what are they to? They're due to two concentrated a urine so that the calcium or oxalate or uric acid gets a too high concentration and it precipitates out. Uh, and so you get little grains of sand and more precipitates out and they get bigger and bigger. And when they shift, so if they just stay up in the kidney, no hassle, when they start to shift, they go into the ureter, the tubes that go from the kidneys to the bladder, and the ureter says, what the hell is going on here? I've got this foreign body inside. And it cramps down trying to express that stone out. And that's what causes the agony, agony of kidney failure. The big deal is not enough water. Because if you've got dilute urine, the stuff won't reach a saturated solution and won't precipitate out. And so you keep on weighing out your calcium, your uric acid, your oxalates. Uh, and you don't get kidney stones. Um, then also you look at... 
uh, the sort of what you do is you get someone who's had kidney stones in your 24-hour urines and see what they're high in and try and avoid those. If they're high in uric acid, you take tablets called xylopram that stops uric acid present, prevent, you know, um, being created, that sort of thing. Yep, you look like someone with knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're the, they're the gold standard. Uh, the, it's a, a financial national thing that it's shockingly expensive to do colonoscopies on, on every patient. And it's got some degree of risk of bowel perforation, anaesthetic complications, but they're not high. Um, and so the preventative medicine people have guidance towards let's go 66% of the whole population and keep the gold standard up our sleeve for people at greater risk. And the people at greater risk are, if you've got a family history of it at all, of polyps or cancer, then, then you, you move on to a routine five yearly colonoscopy. Or if you, when you had one for anything at all uh, and it showed a polyp, you're on the five yearly thing. Or if it's a, an aggressive sort of polyp, you'd be closer. So it's the gold standard, um, but the, 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 the all, all nations of the world, although there's a move in some Scandinavian countries to try and do the whole population. But at the moment where bowel screening, get two thirds um, and get some more on symptoms and still fix them uh, and target the high risk with colonoscopy. Can you go through the public system? Yeah, you can, long waiting, wait, long waiting time. So if, you got, if, if I get someone with a positive faecal human haemoglobin, in other words, they may well have a polyp that's risk, and going through the public system is going to take 12 to 18 months, then I say, look, let's rake up the dough and get it privately and get it done. This has got to be worth it. But once, you're, once you've done that once privately and your next one's due in five years, then in four years, you can start taking steps to get your next one publicly, and when it's due, you're there. So, yeah. Yes? I was going to ask, is, it, is there any truth in the fact that if you start, if a patient is put on blood pressure medication, is it actually harder to come off it? Well, basically, if, you, if you're on blood pressure medication, you'll never get off it. You never get off it? No. Uh, a number of people are on blood pressure medication who have got what you call white cope hypertension, you know. They come into the docs, they always get it. But you can eliminate that by doing a 24-hour blood pressure where they wear the cuff on their arm. It, uh, it takes your blood pressure every half an hour and then um, you print it out the next day. And a, a sleep blood pressure that's elevated is always going to be significant. But it stops you over-treating people who get it when they have a row with their wife or come and see the doctor or, or somebody pinches their parking spot or just their personality. Um, so uh, if you've got it, genuinely, you'll be on something bad, unless you've got a fixable thing. There's particular tumours on the adrenal gland. Uh, there are people who are obese and lose weight, people who are shockingly high in salt and, and knock out their salt, but that doesn't make as much difference as you'd hope. People who lose weight, exercise, drop salt, would be the only group. And they're just about as rare as rocking horse manure, really. <laughs> so. So can you get a, uh, you. Like a, a pad for your arm? Yep. That you can use for 24 hours? No, 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 it's a test. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we just have the surgery and the sister fits it on one day and takes it off the next oh, okay. and gives a reading. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Sorry, somebody else was going to ask me something. Yes. Yeah, yes, you can. But that's where the advantage is if you start, if you start fat with a crook diet, um, then, then you're ahead in a sense because you can, uh, uh, you can get over that uh, because you lose weight, you modify your diet, you've had immense risk factors that you've corrected. But if, you, if you're greyhounds like you and I um, and you get type 2 diabetes, uh, we need to exercise and... Uh, and, and modify a diet, but we haven't got the, the uh, almost the luxury of having being slothful and fat and uh, being able to correct those things because they're the ones who lose it. 
So you and I will have to just exercise more and, uh, and watch what we eat.